Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to study your word together. I thank you, dear Lord, for your wondrous grace and mercy that you died in our place, that you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. I just ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, all the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. Allow us to grow in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve, uh, BlessedHopeForever.com. We're studying together in the book of Revelation, verse by, uh, purportedly verse by verse. But the last four videos have been devoted really more to uh, background material. And we're coming up on the letters to the seven churches here. I pointed out uh, several of the major positions that are taken on these seven churches. Uh, you'd have to refer back to the, the past videos on that. And on the meaning of the day of the Lord, I uh, told you what my uh, position is on that. And on the, on the meaning of the word angel in relation to the seven churches, the word angel being messenger. And I'm looking at the angel uh, as a human messenger. And I, I believe I pointed out in my last video how uh, that there was enough evidence for that. So we're going to begin chapter 2, verse 1. I've really kind of anxiously looked forward to getting into these seven letters, and I hope that you find them as exciting as I do. I pointed out how that John is to write what he saw, the vision of the risen Christ about ready to function on the day of the Lord. The things that are, the condition of the church, which I believe uh, first and foremost precedes the beginning of the day of the Lord, the tribulation period. What's the church going to be like? Uh, I believe it's primarily a look at the condition of the church, primarily uh, the condition of the church, as the Lord is about to return for His church and commence the beginning of the day of the Lord. I think that's what we're seeing. The things which He saw, chapter 1, the things which exist when the Lord's about ready to return, uh, chapters 2 and 3, the things which are yet to be hereafter, uh, chapter 4. Uh, in fact, when we begin chapter 4, we find the Holy Spirit has again identified Himself with that outline, that, that uh, over uh, view or outline. So taking that outline, we're now looking at the condition of the church before the beginning of the day of the Lord. The things which are. The reason there are seven of them, I believe, is because of uh, consistently the number seven is in the Word of God has been the number of completeness. And I'm going to suggest then that these seven letters represent a complete picture of the condition of the church of Christ from when the church began all the way through to the second coming of Christ, but more particularly right before Christ returns. And I know that some are sold on the idea that it represents seven stages of, uh, of human history or seven stages of church history. I do not hold to that view. If you have a different view, uh, if you believe that, that's fine. As, as far as the, uh, uh, the angel is concerned, I recognize full well that in the Jewish church there was some, someone that there was sometimes called an angel which is why some take this to be the Jewish church. I have to take the angel of this church to be the actual message of the church or the, or the messenger of the church is being written to. I recognize that, that uh, there are many great scholars out there, many great students of, of Bible prophecy, many theologians of, of great reputation that they, they've said that the angel always means angel, and that may be. But when we get down to verse 5, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, I find it very difficult to conclude that Christ is addressing a holy, unfallen angel. The idea that the angel would be a fallen angel is, to me, out of the question. But I don't see how you could be uh, addressing an angel uh, that is unfallen. I believe that the angel is a messenger, I believe that messenger is human. 
you know, that holy angels fall uh, is just not acceptable. So I have to take the angel as representing the message that this church holds forth or the messenger himself, just as uh, it, is, that's the, it would be the same with Blessed Hope Forever. Uh, Blessed Hope Forever has a message. It represents a message. It holds forth a message. And that messenger happens to be me, and I pointed out how I wished that in some cases it was not me, but it, that it was someone else. But that's how I'm looking at this. That's how I'm, I'm coming into this, so just so that you understand the position that I'm coming from. Now, folks, listen to me very carefully. There's something very exciting going on here because, and I believe it confirms the fact that this is a human messenger. When I look back at the book, uh, book of Ephesians, because we are looking at the church, the, uh, to the angel at the church of Ephesus, right? First letter here in Revelation. Well, that took me back to Ephesians. And we've, uh, if you look in our playlist, you'll see, you know, we went through Ephesians. We did a verse-by-verse -verse study through Ephesians. And so I couldn't help but, but go back to Ephesians and read Ephesians. And uh, because I felt, well, that, that just seemed like the logical thing to do because we're looking at the letter to Ephesus here in Revelation. And I, I, what I read was Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, plural, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful, plural, in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you, plural, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, plural, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us, plural, in him before the foundation of the world, that we, plural, should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us, plural, and, we, and I could go on and on. Okay. But now let's jump back to Revelation chapter 2. But when we begin looking at chapter 2 in Revelation, now all of a sudden we see something quite striking and something quite remarkable. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience, all of that is singular. Okay? And how thou, singular, canst not bear them which are evil, and thou, singular, hast tried them which say that they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, singular, because thou, singular, hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou singular, art fallen, and repent and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee, singular, quickly, and will remove thy singular candlestick out of his place, except thou, singular, repent. All singular. All plural in Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and here we're looking at all singular. Now that, folks, is a significant difference. The difference here is that Ephesians was written to saints. This letter was written to the message or testimony, the angel, that this church holds forth. If you don't like that, then it's written to the pastor or the bishop or, or you know, or I prefer an elder. You know, I like that a lot better than pastor or teacher or whatever, you know, you want to call me. Although we are to shepherd the flock. But if you're going to say that this is somebody in authority in the church, I'd prefer that the Lord's writing this, you know, to Elder Jeff Davis or, or you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Uh, I hope Jeff... Uh, 
Uh, I hope Jeff saw the humor in that. I think that it's the testimony of the church. It's the message that the church holds forth. It is not written to the plurality of saints, okay, but to this church as a whole. What message does it hold forth? These things say he that holds the seven stars. He holds the stars. Now, why didn't it say, uh, why didn't it say angels? Well, one verse up, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Why doesn't he say, these, thing, these things saith he that holdeth the angels? Well, he, he doesn't. He's sticking with what he pointed out here. Okay? All right. So we've got some ground to cover. And I do hope that you find, especially the end of this video, a real blessing because I, I ran into a roadblock. I don't mind telling you. I mean, my, my, my head literally, figuratively just, you know, banged into a brick wall. I was stumped. I wrestled. I had tossed and, and turned uh, for hours, uh, even, uh, I think, in my sleep, uh, trying to figure out what the problem was because I ran into a, a real problem, and we'll talk about that as we go on. So the star, I believe, represents somebody in authority. That's, that's why I've taken that position. Uh, it's a present participle. Uh, I mean, I want you to imagine, folks, that he is always holding, grasping, seizing, controlling the stars. And he has them in his right hand, his hand of authority. And he's walking, again, it's a, it's a present participle, he's walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Well, why didn't he say seven churches? Because he's sticking to the symbols that he's given so that we might recognize what he's saying. If he said seven churches, you wouldn't think about light. So he says golden candlesticks. He wants us, I believe, to think about light. Why are we here? We're here because God has commissioned us to hold forth light in a dark place. Okay? And he walks in the midst of those seven golden candlesticks. You know, most Christians, I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, oh, they love the Lord. He's out, but you know, he, he's out there someplace. You can pray to him. You know, he seems distant. Folks, he's here. He's right here, right now. He's here. He walks within our midst. Even this online church ministry. Okay? He's present. He's with you every day. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He knows what you think. He sees every deed that you do. He's not some distant God. He's one who walks with you, walks among you. Jesus Christ is in our midst. He sees what we do. He knows what we think, how we act. He knows the testimony of this church. He knows the testimony of Blessed Hope Forever. He knows the testimony of this congregation. That which we hold forth. He, he knows it, okay? Whether it's brick and mortar or it's a pole barn or it's YouTube, a website, a group chat, a, or a meeting in an open cow pasture, okay? He's walking in the midst of the church. The reason that he uses golden candlesticks is because he wants us to realize that we are precious and that we hold forth the light. What kind of a light? You know, it's easy as you, you look at verse 1 to say, you know, this can't be. You know, this church believes in the sovereignty of God. If God is sovereign, how can the church be anything but perfect? You know, dearly beloved, why do you think that the book of Job was given us? You know, to tell you about Job's life, to tell you about, to write history? No. To tell you that God can take one of his own and snap his fingers and let evil come into Job's life. You know, he's... 
His kids are dead. His wife is taunting him. He's, he's sick with, with uh, elephantitis or black leprosy or something or, or, the, or another. You know, what a mess. And if God be God, if God is sovereign, why would one of those who loved him and served him be in such a condition? Don't ask. God had purpose and reason in it. God hasn't hid this from you. We read in Acts, I know that after my departure, grievous wolves shall come in among you. Okay? We are to be light. The, the, the candlestick represents light. And he can remove it. He can remove it. You know, we know that God has ordained that false, apostles, uh, false believers, uh, false apostles, false teachers will come into the church and teach that which is not light. We know this. And just because God is sovereign doesn't mean that weeds don't come in, come in the garden. God has a purpose in that. How committed are we to this book? You've heard me talk a lot about the importance of our spending time in this book. Let me tell you that today, the organized Christian church is not very much committed to the Word of God. So we have hordes of people who claim the label Christian, who have little idea about the deity of Christ, His substitutionary death, or the price that He paid, that what He truly accomplished on, behalf, on our behalf, God didn't hide this from us. And we're going to see that condition as we go through these seven churches. I know thy works. And, and I'm not going to go through all these Greek words. I know is, uh, well, that's a perfect tense. I just can't help but think how wonderful that is. That is a perfect tense. I know. I know intellectually. I know absolutely. I know precisely your work and your labor, he says. That's what makes you tired. The interesting difference in the, in the nuance of those words is that the first word for work means your occupation, what you do. The second one is that, it, you know, uh, it really is a word that, that means to work to the point of exhaustion. And I know thy patience. Thy, thy, thy. These are all singular, folks. Singular works. Singular labor. Singular patience. And how you, singular, cannot bear them which are evil. You've tried them. You've tested them. You've put them to the test. You've tested, the, tested them with the consummate, and you've tested them through this book, okay? You've tested them with the result that you expect the right answer. You've put them to the test. When they say that they're apostles and prove that they're not, you found them to be liars, okay? And again, the, the, it's singular, okay? It's what the church, singular, did. There's, I don't know, there's got to be a lot. There's got to be, there's probably a thousand commentaries on Revelation, you know, that will immediately in this verse take you back to 1 Thessalonians. I know your work of faith, labor of love and patience with hope. And, and then the sermon goes on for the rest of the hour, you know, that there's no faith there, there's no love there, and there's no hope there. And, and I'm not sure that that's fair. First of all, it's, 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 these aren't singulars. These are plurals. These are to the saints. First of all, it's a work of faith. These are works. God isn't saying anything wrong in this. They did this, okay? This is a commendation. We're looking at a commendation, folks, here, okay? God is commending the angel here, okay? Whoever you take that messenger... To be, he really did this. The message that's the, the, what that church puts forth or stands for. If you want to take it as the church as a whole, that's fine. But but it's singular, okay? The, he's writing to an angel 
And the angel is a singular individual or is a singular message. That's what I'm trying to say. It happened. They, they, they or he, you know, this angel, this messenger, he tested apostles who said that they were messengers of God teaching truth and he found that they were not. Okay? And they were tested. The only way they could be tested was through God's Word. In Peter, we have a responsibility to test the spirits. Okay? That's a plural. Okay? Here it's singular. There's a difference between... it's One of the first questions, folks, when you're studying is you want to look at personal pronouns. The, one of the first questions that you would ask is, who is he writing to? Okay? Is he writing to an individual, like Paul writing to Timothy? Is he writing... You know, note the, the, the personal pronouns. Note, take a note, serious note of the singular and the plural. Did you know that doctrinal truth can hinge upon, or our understanding of it can hinge upon something as simple as the difference between a singular and a plural? Okay? Now, the fact that somebody says that they love the Lord does not necessarily mean that what they're teaching is the truth. Now, that shouldn't be hard for most of us to wrap our minds around, okay? I, just because my brother over here, he, whoever he is, he's not teaching the truth, I have no right to say that he does not love the Lord. And I certainly don't have any right to say that the Lord doesn't love him. But, so he shouldn't be judged. But the basis of that judgment is not our opinion, it's this book, the Word of God. There is not any indication at all in verse 2 that there isn't any faith in their works or any love in their labor or any hope in their patience. You know, that may be t perfectly all right if, if you want to preach a sermon, but I see this as a commendation. This is a good thing. I know what you've done, and it's a good thing. Not only that you have born, you, singular, have born, and you, singular, have had patience, and you've, and you've done this, you, singular, have done this because of my name's sake. You've labored, you, singular, have labored, and actually have not been, you, singular, have not been exhausted. You know, the word not fainted, weary, the word means to work to the point of exhaustion. And God says, you, have worked to what is normally the point of exhaustion, and you, singular, haven't fainted. You haven't, uh, you haven't given up. You're not so exhausted in this activity that you've quit. So that's all good. It's all good stuff. Nevertheless, verse 4, and here's where it gets interesting, and I want you to bear with me here. I hope I explain this right. This is, this, where, this is where we're getting into that area where I kind of run into a wall. Nevertheless, verse 4, I have this against you. Now, if you, if you have the authorized version, uh, they stuck in the word somewhat. You'll notice, uh, I think most of you, whatever translation that, that you're looking at, most of them will probably have it as, as an, it's italicized. The translators included that word. The word is not there, okay? It isn't that he has something little against them. I have this against thee. Thou hast left thy first love, okay? Left thy first love. First thing I thought of going through this was how could he commend them so much before he said this and then, and then say you've left your first love? That kind of puzzled me just a bit. And, and I'm hoping that you'll hang in here with me and see the excitement as we come out of the end of this. If we go to Matthew 22, we read that when the Pharisees had heard that he had, had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. And one of them, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God 
with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now I recognize that we're not under law, we're under grace. But God's attitude has not changed. We spend a lot of time on His loving us. I have spent an enormous amount of time with you folks telling you just how much God loves you. And He does. But, you know, and, and, and I'm thrilled, folks, that He loves us. I'm not sure how much time we spend on the concept of our love for Him, though. We can love Him because He forgave our sins, because He died in our place, but we don't like the things He does. Sometimes we don't like those things. He doesn't treat us right, you know. Uh, we pray and those things don't happen. You know, we have difficulties and trials and hardships, and we, sometimes we might even get mad at God. And, and that's, that's terrible. Are you inferring that He doesn't love you with an everlasting love? Well, of course He does. Of course He does. But how much time have we really spent, have I really spent on this channel telling you folks about our love for Him? Probably not as much as I would have liked to. When I go back over, when I look at uh, John chapter, uh, John chapter 8, you seek to kill me a man that has told you the truth, which I have heard of God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said unto him, We're not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. Now, wouldn't you expect him to say, If God is your father, I would love you? He didn't say that. What he said was, if God were your father, you would love me. You know, my, my dad, he was, uh, he's gone now to be with the Lord, but he was a hard worker. He was a disciplinarian. He, he wasn't a very, the emotional kind of type person. Uh, and I guess I respected my father. I feared my father. But I really did not listen to me, folks, listen. I really didn't love my father until I was much older and I realized just how much he suffered. You know, we were really poor. He carried a load that I, I never understood until I was much older in life. If God were your, were your father, you would love me. John chapter 14, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 21, when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon, Peter, do you love me? You know, you all know that in, in John 21. Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Do you really love the Lord? Feed his sheep. Oh, no, Steve, I, I don't have time to feed the sheep. i, I got to concentrate on my worship and my, my love for him or my job or this or that or the other thing. Feed my sheep, he said. 2 Corinthians 2, the fifth verse. Fifth verse of 2 Corinthians 2. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that he loves. No, no, for them that love him. Okay? And I think that a lot of Christians will read that as things future. I did for many years. And, and folks, I hate slaughtering sacred cows here, but listen, God is... It's, look what it says. But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. 
Why does it not say for whom he loved? For them that love him. And it, in, of course, in, in Ephesians itself, you have lots of verses like this. The end of chapter 6, grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. And believe me, folks, we may not, not always make use of that which we have received. And I remind you that here he is addressing, right here in our present study, he is addressing the angel of the church at Ephesus. You know, and I spend a whole lot of time telling people about how much Jesus loves them, but in James 1.12, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to who? To those who he loves? No. To them that love him. James 2.5, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him. You know, the easiest thing is to promise the, that to those who, who love him when the promise is, uh, the easiest thing is to promise that to those that he loves when the promise is to those that love him. In 1 John, we love him because he first loved us. In the, in the seventh chapter of Luke, if you, if you go to Luke chapter 7, verse 41, there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Okay? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And Christ said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Okay? He who has been forgiven the most. We don't often talk about our love for the Lord because we are so prone to concentrate so heavily on His love for us, and that's been my fault, I suppose. It's just such a cherished truth. It has been in my life, and it's a truth I've wanted to pass on to you folks. God never has anything against us. He loves us, uh, us with an everlasting love. But it would be foolishness, it would be utter foolishness to argue, to try to argue the fact that every single believer for whom Christ died, that we all have an equal love for Him. Okay? We all just love Him just as much as I love Him just as much as you love Him. You love Him just as much as I love Him. Every single one of us loves the Lord equally, okay? And folks, listen to me. That is not biblical, okay? Of course there are believers who love Him more sincerely than others. And so we're looking at a verse here that sort of sets us back on our heels, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, because I have this against you. You've left your first love. Well, the, the word first, the first, I don't believe, is one. And the word doesn't mean in time, first as in uh, sequence, time sequence. This is the first one you ever had. This is their primary love, their most important love. Okay? Listen carefully, very carefully, and do not misunderstand what I'm saying. Our primary, okay, our primary love, concern, is our love for Him, not His for us, okay? We are not to be concerned about His constant, unending, never-changing love for us, because that's what it is. It's constant. It's unending. He will never stop loving us. Our, that's not our primary concern. Our primary concern, folks, is our love for Him. What the text is saying to the angel is you've left your primary consideration, and that's your love. 
It's a present imperative. In the fifth verse, remember, I command you to I command you to remember. It's in the imperative mood. Therefore, from whence thou art fallen. I don't know how many Christians have read that, and we'll see. There, Steve, there's a verse that, that teaches against eternal security. No, not not true at all. We don't. We're not falling from grace. Great falling from grace is not, or even falling away, you know, in this in the sense of our our context here is not falling into hell. Okay. Remember. Therefore, from whence thou art fallen. We love him because he first loved us, for sure. But I believe the extent to which we love him is directly linked to the extent to which we feed the sheep, that is, to which we teach the truth of God's word, not to things that we think we ought to do to become pleasing to God. That's law. But, and, and to, to suggest that every Christian loves Christ equally is really just foolish, in my opinion, when Scripture is certainly not in agreement with that assertion. In Galatians, we read that we have that you have fallen from grace, okay? And, and we've had too many sermons preached on that, which don't understand what that's saying. You know, well, when you sin, you fall from grace. That is not true. Falling from grace is to fall back to law. Grace says you're not under law, but under grace. Grace says you're redeemed by the finished work of Jesus Christ, not by anything that you did. And if you fall back to keeping the law, you have fallen from grace, the law. That's what the text says here. It says, remember, I command you to remember from where you have fallen. Okay? And I've talked so much about His undying love for us, but so little of our love for Him. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works. Well, folks, how did we start out? Remember back to your early days. You know, you, you came to, to Christ, you, you were bankrupt, total, totally bankrupt of anything in and of yourself that, was, that you could offer to, to God as being worthy in and of yourself. And then wasn't very long before you, you, you came to storm the throne of grace, demanding, you know, to know what you could do for God. You, you kind of forgot about or, or failed to go on to learn and grow in grace and knowledge of Christ to, to come to understand or that you would understand what Christ had done for you. It all became all about you, not Christ. You remember that? Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent. That is, change your mind and do the first works. So, ever so subtly, law creeps in, and when it does, we place ourselves back under law. And as a, as a result, we preach law not grace i've had few people say to me you know with tears in their eyes you know i well i just steve i just can't put into words just how much i love the lord jesus christ i've had few people say that but i've heard a lot of people say you know i can't put into words how much christ loves me remember where from where you've fallen change your mind repent change your mind the word is, means a change of mind. And do the first work, which seems to indicate that it was based on their love for Him, the one who is the Word. And if you don't do that, I'm going to come and I'm going to quickly remove your candlestick out of its place except you repent. And if you look at that phrase in the Greek, what you'll find out, and you look at those Greek words very carefully as you go through that phrase, Okay, you'll find out that it results, it's a situation which, which results in commotion. Okay? You Greek students, take a look at that. You'll see what I'm talking about. 
Well, I mean, you know, he's the sovereign God that, that can hold uh, any testimony, any star in his right hand, any, any, any testimony that he intends that they hold. That's true. You know how big I am on God's sovereignty. I'm not in any way going to suggest that God has not ordained this condition so that we might learn a gracious, loving God has brought difficulty in our path so we might learn. You know, if, if Blessed Hope Forever is not willing as, as an online church to remain faithful to the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, then its message will not be a light in darkness. He will remove the candlestick from its place. Verse 6, but this thou hast. Now we're going back to some more positive things. And this is where it gets interesting. We kind of got interrupted. He was going along well. He was telling us how good we are. And then he drops this, you've left your first love on us. And now he's going back to, but this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So now we're back to some commendation again. This is what I struggle with, folks. I, I don't know how to hardly, I hardly know how to put this in words. How can he do this? This is an individual. This, these aren't the church saints. This is not like the letter to, that Paul wrote to Ephesus where we, we saw all the plurals. These are all singulars here. This is to the angel, the message of the church at Ephesus, right? Okay? This is one individual, one message, and yet... You have him commending them for all. Look, they've, they've tested these false apostles to see that they're not genuine. They've proved them to be liars. They've, they've studied hard. They've labored intensively to the point of exhaustion. You know, we read the text. We read this, okay? They've done all this. And then, we just to find out that the same message, the same individual has left its first love. How can that be? How can that be? And now to go back to verse 6, but this thou hast that thou hatest the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And I recognize, folks, all the literature that's written on this. And let me tell you honestly, nobody knows who these people were. Uh, they were either followers of, of Nicholas or, you know, uh, it's from the word conquer, to take authority over the assembly. You know, now maybe it doesn't mean that. I believe that that's what, the, what it means. Maybe it's the assembly taking authority. You can do all kinds of things with this word. There are surely cases in the church where the people rule, govern the church, the direction of the church more than the pastor, more than doctrine, Okay. You know, people that have itching ears or have a little much too too little too much authority over what's what the church stands for. This is written to a singular angel message of the church. Okay. Most people take it as victory over the laity because of the word uh, valum in Hebrew means conqueror of the people. And they tie them together when we get to the church at Pergamum. You know, if you want to take that as victory over the lady, then there's there, there are a lot of scholars that'll agree with you. If you want to take it as followers of Nicholas, who believe that because you're a Christian, you can do anything you want. You know, you can involve yourself with, you know, the harlots of the temple and all that. You can take it that way. Some say we can't know the identity of the Nicolaitans. I have my view on this. I've got my own personal view on this. I'm not sure that God put anything in His Word that we couldn't know. But there's a there's something really exciting to see here in this first letter. I'm hoping that I can uh, bring it out. Uh, I'm not sure I'm doing a very good job of getting us there, but bear with me and we'll try to make it. What we know is that the uh, Nicolaitans, they were a heretical sect who followed the teachings of Nicholas. Okay, name means conquers the people. And uh, so some suggest that they were encouraged 
or they encouraged each other to eat things offered sacrifice to idols. To eat things. How many times have you heard me say we get together and we feast upon His Word? And they eat things offered to idols. Or, symbolically, you know, it's, you know, uh, well, it, it just, it, it could be a reference to the laity feasting, uh, feasting upon their own word rather than the truth of God's word, which the angel is to proclaim. Now, interestingly, the Greek word Nicola means let us eat, okay? The church at Pergamos, uh, unlike the Ephesians, they actually embraced the teachings of the Nicolaitans. But whether one extreme or the other, whether it's legalism we're looking at, licentiousness, which most people look at the, look at it as as worldliness, licentiousness, they w really went off, you know, and just lived however they wanted. Uh, they, uh, as Scripture says, they uh, uh, they I. I Sure, they, they did spite unto the spirit of grace. You know, they, they were under grace so we can just live however we want. The fact remains that on, the only way to recognize false teaching is, is through this book, is to know it through a diligent study of God's Word. So I'm going to simply suggest that what they describe, these Nicolaitans, they describe a situation where that the laity assumes authority over the the clergy, so to speak, the congregation determines what is taught from the pulpit, so to speak. That's what I'm going to suggest. To me, in my mind, that's what it represents. The, the pastor, the bishop, whoever's doing the teaching, the angel does not have the backbone to stand up to the congregation and teach the truth because his fear is in doing so, he's going to lose his congregation. And so, therefore, the congregation really drives the message of the ministry, not the, the teacher, not the pastor. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one that has an ear is one who is God's sheep. We've talked a lot about that. My sheep hear my voice. And all of a sudden now, get this, all of a sudden the text now changes to his saints. All right? Just as the letter to Ephesus was written to the saints at Ephesus. Now we suddenly have God saying, I have some there that have an ear. They're my sheep. I want you to hear what I'm saying to this messenger. As my sheep, are you in a church that holds forth light in a dark world? I mean, think seriously about this. You're my sheep. And to him that overcomes... And uh, we know, we know from other scripture, we know that he that overcometh the world is he that believes that, that Jesus is the Christ. We are not overcomers. We, we, are, we are overcomers, but we're only overcomers because of what Christ did. It's not we who needs to overcome. That's just putting it, that's the simple way of saying it. And... Uh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay? It contrasts Adam and Eve being banned from eating of the tree of life after they sinned. You know, uh, there are those who believe that the, that tree of life, uh, that tree of life is necessary for us to live eternally. If we got to eat of it, if we don't, we're going to die. That's, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, that can't be what it's saying. There are others who believe that it's a reward for those who faithfully serve and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's the tree of life is meritorious. Well, I, I can't accept that either because the only, only reason that we overcome is we, because we've been born of God. And so every single one of His children will eat of the tree of life. My personal belief is that this is an expression that describes a, a situation whereby because every believer in Christ is an overcomer, they will in paradise, or that is in heaven, exist in a state whereby because they will eat of the tree of life, okay, they, they will be granted to eat of the tree of life. They'll do so because 
They will exist in a state of sinless perfection, just as Adam and Eve did before they fell into sin. Christ having become their substitute for the payment of that sin. And I'm almost out of time, so let me get to where I, I really, what I wanted to say here uh, that I kind of held back on until the end of this video, and that is, listen, I, I'm afraid I'm not going to do a very good job of describing this but uh, or explaining this, but try to follow my logic here. We know that we serve a God of wondrous grace, unending grace, uh, indescribable grace. Now, I'll, I'll grant you there's a lot of Christians today that, that aren't so focused on that. But when I look at this first letter, and we've just looked at one, the first letter to Ephesus. When I look at this letter and I see how that our Lord go, is speaking to this angel, this messenger at the church at Ephesus, and he goes on and he commends them. Uh, he commends that messenger or that message that's being preached, what this church stands for. And he has so much good to say about that messenger or that message. He commends them in ways that are quite remarkable only to say that he's left his first love. I remind you, these are singulars, not plurals, okay? Left your first love. Now, if I heard that, that would be devastating. And, and I, I, when I went through this, I thought, you know, Lord, I like what you've said up here in, in, in verse two and three and four, you know, and then I, but I get down to, you know, now you've left your first love and Lord, I, I, I don't know. Now I'm, I'm, man, I don't want, I don't want to claim that verse. I don't, I don't believe that I've left my first love and I, but he, what the point I'm trying to make here, folks, is that he's talking to the same person. You can't, because it's not plural. It's because it's not written to the saints. You can't go through this text, listen carefully. In my opinion, my humble opinion, you cannot go through this text and pick and choose which you want to apply to yourself. Well, I've labored heavily. I've ex exposed these false uh, apostles who say that they're, they're apostles, but they're not, and I've proven them to be liars, and, and I've, I've worked to the point of, of exhaustion, okay? But, but I, haven't, well, I haven't left my first love. I haven't done that. Folks, it's singular. Okay. Maybe this will clear it up, up the fog here a little bit. What I'm seeing here is when I was, and this is what caused my disturbance, okay, in my, in my head here, was I couldn't understand how that he could be commending them and criticizing them both in, which seemed contradictory until it, after wrestling with this for hours, okay, I had to come to the realization that what he said to this angel was true. Every bit of it was true, all of it, including the fact he had left his first love. In other words, despite the fact that he had left his first love, which was something that the Lord did have somewhat, not somewhat, but had against him, okay, and that he needed to repent because he had left his first love and do the works that he had done from the beginning, even though that was true, all of the, the rest of, of what was we look at as positives, all of the rest of that he commended them this end of this messenger for was true. And I thought about that and I'm trying to wrap my mind around that, how that it could all be true because it's singular. It's written to the one angel of the church. And, uh, the only conclusion that all the only way I could recognize reconcile all this in my head was was I it, it suddenly dawned on me and this was a beautiful moment folks it dawned on me that what I was looking at was the grace of God 
the grace of Christ, the love and the grace of Christ. As bad as it sounds that he had left his first love, despite the fact that this angel had left his first love, he was still commended in all these other ways. That's what I'm saying. I hope you see that. I'm out of time. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for everything. Until next time, thanks for watching.